Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of text that I read just a few moments ago over in the book of Exodus, chapter 15, verses 22 through 27. The message entitled, Bitter Waters and Sweet, Naomi and the Desert, part one. Rather interesting, we find a word here in our text that Naomi later calls herself in the book of Ruth. Bitter waters and sweet, Naomi and the desert. Now, over the past three weeks, we looked at the second, third, and fourth divisions of the song that we have here in chapter 15. The song of Moses, which is mentioned here in Exodus 15, and also mentioned in who remembers? Revelation 15. That's right, we find it here in Exodus. We find it is mentioned again over in Revelation 15 where we have the Song of Moses and the Song of the Lamb. Very significant and we'll be studying that in more detail when we get to that point in the book of Revelation. But we've already looked a great deal at it, 16 weeks on the music in the Bible. But we saw already the second division was verses four through eight. We saw that verses one through three gave the introduction to the song, including the title, the story summary, the participants, the purpose of the song, which introduced the second section, verses four through eight, which gives a capsule summary of the war that occurred, and verse three made it clear that God gets all the credit for the battle. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Then the next five verses tell us how he won the battle. Verse four gives an interesting comment on how Pharaoh's chariots and army ended up in the sea. Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath he, that is God, cast into the sea. Pharaoh thought that he was running things according to his time schedule and in his manner, and of course that he thought he was totally independent from God in the actions that he took. They thought that it was by their own free will that they were charging after the Jews. They were chasing Jews, avenging Egypt, obeying Pharaoh, the God-man. They had no respect for the God of the Jews, and in their own opinion they were being they were not being irresistibly drawn along, but in fact they were being grabbed and catapulted into the sea by the hand of God whom they hated. God is always in control. We spent a great deal of time last week talking about how man does not have free will, that the only free will in the universe is the will of God, for only God has the capacity to have a free will. Only he is omnipotent so that he can do whatever he wants to do. Our will is limited by the fact that we are not omnipotent. Only God has a free will because only he is omniscient. Only he can see the end from the beginning. So we may think that we have a free will when we do something, but it doesn't turn out like we plan. We're not omniscient. We don't have a free will because we're not omnipresent. We can't, if we wish to do so, jump to the moon. We can't be there. And we can't be on the moon and on earth at the same time. The only one who has a truly free will that is unlimited, unhindered, is God himself. Pharaoh thinks that he has a free will, but he obviously does not have a free will. He was very much in the palm of God's fist, even though they weren't aware of it. They were as good as dead, even as they screamed their curses at the Jews. It was God, not Pharaoh, who was in control. We talked about how in this chapter, the sovereignty of God is first and foremost in view in everything that happened to Pharaoh here. We saw that this happens repeatedly in the Bible. We looked at examples from the book of Job and from the speech of Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel. Job understood how to approach the sovereignty of God with humility and not with pride. We saw the exact opposite with Nebuchadnezzar who walked in pride, was crushed, and at the end when his mind was restored, then he gave glory to the God of heaven because he knew he was not the big cheese that he thought that he was. That was Daniel 4, 34 through 37. We parallel the third and fourth divisions of the song with the statements that the apostle Paul makes concerning the sovereignty of God. Paul is very clear and he uses Pharaoh as a specific example. Romans 9, 15 says, For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Verse 16, very, very clear. So then, it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. We're going to see those two things, God in judgment, making the decision, and then God showing mercy a little bit later on as we go through this Exodus 15. 
And then he mentions Pharaoh. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy. And the text specifically says he had mercy on Israel. And whom he will he hardeneth. And we learn that half the times that it speaks of Pharaoh's heart being hardened, half the times it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart, and half the times it says Pharaoh hardened Pharaoh's heart. But the sovereign superintending overriding will of God is what was in control. Then we find the various complaints that men make against God. We talked about how all of those are irrelevant and they are actually blasphemous. And then we saw that Paul had 13 points using Pharaoh as an example. Number one, the mercy of God is not earned, it is sovereignly bestowed. Number two, man does not have free will. Number three, the purposes of God include reprobation. Here, it's raising Pharaoh up for the purpose of destroying him. Number four, God destroys the rebels to terrify the rest of the earth, even though they will still refuse to obey him. People don't get it. They see that it's God. They are scared stiff of him, but they still won't obey. It's amazing. Sometimes Christians are like that too. They know God's in control. They know what he's told them to do, and they refuse to do it because they want to do their own thing. Number five, God destroys rebels to glorify his own name and prove that the rebellion will never succeed. Number six, God not only shows mercy, but God hardens hearts to demonstrate all aspects of his character. Number seven, this is no excuse for man to use the argument of fatalism. Number eight, this is no excuse for man to make an accusation against God. Number nine, this is no excuse for man to give up and refuse to turn to God. Number ten, we are made of dirt just like Adam. When we die, we return to the dust, but God is unchanging. Number eleven, the creature has no rights to challenge the creator. Why have you made me thus? Number twelve, the purpose of God includes showing the wrath against sin as well as showing his grace and mercy. And finally, God has the right to sovereignly exercise grace to those who do not deserve it just as much as he has the right to sovereignly exercise wrath against those who truly do deserve it. <clears throat> now that takes us through what we've covered so far. There's still a few loose ends that we need to pick up before we move into the verses dealing with bitter water and sweet water. Verse 9 and following prove that Pharaoh thought that he was doing his own thing and that God could not stop him. Now there are six claims given in the text, six claims that set out Pharaoh's intent. Verse 9 lists them. Here's what the enemy said. I will pursue, number one. Number two, I will, I will overtake. Number three, I will divide the spoil. Number four, my lust shall be satisfied upon them. Number five, I will draw out my sword. Number six, my hand shall destroy them. Now if you think about that carefully, these are the six steps of all pagan conquest worldwide every time there has been a pagan army involved in battle and they have conquered someone else. The six steps of pagan conquest. Chase, capture, divide booty, rape, prepare to execute, and murder. Those are the six steps that Pharaoh lines out for himself. That's what he's going to do. He's used to winning in wars. And he's not about to be stopped by some god of Israel. He's going to get them anyway. He's going to take the Jews and he will satisfy his lusts upon them. Those petty boasts are then followed in the text by the acts of God that completely stop the steps of pagan conquest. Now, you'll learn something very interesting as you go through the Bible because the Bible declares many times the acts of God, what God does. The acts of God everywhere in the Bible always declare four things. Number one, they tell you what God did so that you don't have to guess about it. Number one, what God did. Number two, it always tells you the results accomplished. The results accomplished. Number three, God always explains why he did it. The intended purposes of God. And number four, then we find the scripture records praise for his acts. So every time we find the acts of God in the Bible, you see those four things. Number one, what God did. Number two, the results accomplished. Number three, the intended purposes of God, why he did it. And number four, 
praise for his mighty acts. Verses 10 and 11 in the text give what I call a summary and a praise. In other words, how God responded to Pharaoh's intent. A summary of what God did. Verse 10, Thou didst blow with thy wind, the sea covered them, they sank as lead in the mighty waters. So that's a summary of what God did. Verse 11 gives the praise. Who is like thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? So we find a quick summary and praise, which is immediately followed by the two basic acts of God, which we see throughout the Bible and throughout human history. The two basic acts of God, which are always revealed in all of human history, are these. First act is judgment. Judgment. That's verse 12. Thou stretchest out thy right hand, the earth swallowed them. By the way, notice a contrast here in verse 11. It says the earth swallowed them. That's contrast with sea and mighty waters back in verse 10. God marshaled all of creation against Pharaoh, especially when you think back about the plagues, because very ironic since Pharaoh worshipped much of creation. So God marshaled all those different plagues, which each was an attack on a different god of Egypt, and then he marshaled the sea and he marshaled the earth against Pharaoh. Was there any way that Pharaoh could win? <laughs> I think not. So judgment is number one. God's second act, and we always see this quickly tied whenever God judges. The second act is mercy. Mercy, that's verse 13. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. So, a fourfold division that's divided in half. Now we find another, and each of those has two parts to it. Then we find another twofold division, which give to us the results and the purposes. And this is set out in poetic form. We talked about how this, this song is actually written in Hebrew poetry. And we see one of the parallelisms here in the next verse. The parallelism is, it says A, B, and then the next one goes A, B, like that. A is judgment, followed by B, mercy. And then you see fear, A, followed by blessing. So judgment and fear are the A part, and mercy and blessing are the B part, as you look at that division there. Mercy is followed by the intended and accomplished results. We're going to talk about results and purposes here. So mercy is followed by the intended and accomplished results of the acts of God. What were the results of the acts of God? What did God intend to accomplish? And what did he in fact accomplish? You see that in verses 14 through 16. The people shall hear and be afraid. Sorrow shall take hold on the inhabitants of Palestina. <laughs> you know, God showed mercy to Israel, but he had some results that he wanted the people of the nations around to have well concretized in their minds. The people shall hear and be afraid. Saul shall take hold on the inhabitants of Palestina. Then the dukes of Edom shall be amazed. The mighty men of Moab, trembling, shall take hold upon them. All the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away. Fear and dread shall fall upon them. By the greatness of thine arm, they shall be still as stone till thy people pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over which thou hast purchased. And so we saw verse 12, judgment. Verse 13, mercy. Then we find the accomplished results of the acts of God, which is implanting fear into the hearts of all the pagan nations around. And then we find the results of the acts of God are followed by the intended and accomplished purposes of the acts of God. Here is his purpose, verse 17. Speaking of his mercy to the Jews in this parallel form that we see here. Verse 17, Thou shalt bring them in, speaking of the Jews, and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in, in the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have established. Judgment followed by mercy. Fear followed by blessing. Judgment on the pagans. Mercy on the Jews. Fear among the pagans. Blessing to the Jews. Very interesting structures as we move through this song. The song is then a three-part ending, just like it had a three-part beginning. 
You remember we looked back, if you remember back at the very beginning, we saw the three parts that introdu introduce this song. And in opposition to that, we now come to A, the conclusion, B, the summary, and C, the response of the people. So the conclusion, the conclusion is verse 18. After all is said and done, what do we have in the end? Verse 18. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. Then we find a summary of everything that's gone before in the song. For the horse of Pharaoh went in with his chariots and with his horsemen into the sea. And the Lord brought again the waters of the sea upon them. But the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea. There's a summary of everything that has just transpired in the psalm going before. And then we find, and this is important because this is how we should always respond as believers, how we should always respond to the acts of God. There is a five-fold response of God's people. Number one, it produced action. Number two, it produced words. Number three, it produced music. Number four, it produced praise. And number five, it produced worship. How are God's people supposed to respond to the acts of God which judge the heathen and bring blessing to God's people? How are we to respond? Exactly the same way that we see in this fivefold response of the children of Israel. Action, it should change the way we live. Words, it should change the way we speak. Music, it should change the stuff we listen to and the stuff that we sing. Four, praise. It should cause us to praise him for his great deliverance, for his mercy to us, for his kindness to us, for his provision for us. I mean, you go on and on and on, all the different things for which we must praise the Lord. And finally, that brings us to the point where we fall on our faces before him and we worship him. Those are some important lessons for us today. And then we find one final discussion here that we need to deal with because this is a big issue in the charismatic movement today and they are wrong when they talk about it. Verse 15, uh, chapter 15, verse 20 says, And Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron. It's the issue of prophetess in the Bible. I hope you've taken some notes because I'm going to give you a whole bunch of passages today that deal with that issue. But the Old Testament, we find that there are a number of women who are called prophetesses. In fact, quite a bunch of them. Exodus chapter 15, 20, we've got right here. And Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron. But then we find over in Judges chapter 4, verse 4, it talks about, And Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidot, she judged Israel at that time. We get to 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 14. So Hilkiah the priest, and Ahikam, and Achbor, and Shaphan, and Asahiah went unto Huldah the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikva, the son of Harhas, keeper of the wardrobe. How would you like to be known for that? I'm the keeper of the wardrobe. Now she dwelt in Jerusalem in the college, and they communed with her. We've heard her mentioned again over in 2 Chronicles 34, 22. And Hilkiah, and they that the king had appointed, went to Huldah the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikvah, son of Hasra, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she dwelt in Jerusalem in the college, and they spake to her to that effect. We find another one mentioned in the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 14. By God, think thou upon Tobiah and Sanballat, according to these their works, and on the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets that would have put me in fear. So there's some woman called the prophetess Noadiah. Then we find a really interesting one over in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 3. And I, that is I, Isaiah, went unto the prophetess, and she conceived and bare a son. Then said the Lord to me, Call his name Maher Shalal Hashbaaz. Now you try to say that one, Maher Shalal Hashbaaz. <laughs> work on it. I had to work on it. In the New Testament, before the day of Pentecost, we find one woman is called a prophetess. That's before Pentecost. That's over in Luke chapter 2, verse 36. And there was one Anna, a prophetess, 
the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age and had lived with an husband seven years from her virginity. And some people, it's a long story as to how they try to figure out how old she is, but there are several different things. It doesn't matter for our discussion today, but she's called a prophetess here. In the New Testament, on the day of Pentecost, so we're moving from God dealing with national Israel, God now going to be moving to deal with an international group, which is called the church, starting out with Jewish males in chapter 2, and moving to Jewish men and women as we get over to Acts chapter 8, and then moving to a man who is Gentile by birth but Jewish by religion, the Ethiopian eunuch, and he's not a male or a female, and then to those who are Gentiles 100% in Acts chapter 10, the Roman oppressors. So we see an expansion, and those of you who've been with us through the book of Acts know how that expansion worked. But here on the very first day, the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, Peter quotes Joel concerning females prophesying in the last days. Acts chapter 2, verse 17. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall see dream, or dream dreams. Now there's still some future aspects to that prophet, uh, prophecy, and Peter explains that, and if you're with us in Acts, which we won't go over again at this time, there are specific things that are included, as Peter quotes the whole passage, and other things that are reserved for yet a future date during the tribulation. But at least it mentions daughters prophesying. We also find another passage in the New Testament, clearly inside the church age. In the New Testament, we're told that the daughters of Philip prophesied. So the question is, did they have the gift of prophet? The first thing to notice as we read this passage is that they are not called prophetesses. Prophetess says, they are, it simply says that they prophesied. Listen to this. Acts 21.9 And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. So, what about the noun prophetess in the New Testament? We saw there was a verbal form used there in Acts 21. But what about the noun prophetess in the New Testament? The only woman in the New Testament who is called a prophetess is Jezebel in the book of Revelation. And she's obviously a false prophetess with supernatural powers that were not given by God. Revelation chapter 2, verse 20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed to idols. But you say, wait a minute, Paul seems to imply that women prophesied in the church over in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Well, let's look at it. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 5. But a woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. So she doesn't have her head covered it's the same thing as she should be shaved bald. But he talks about every woman that prayeth or prophesieth. They say, aha, you see, there was prophecy going on with the women in the New Testament church. Okay, let's read the rest of the passage to get the context. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. Have her hair all cut off. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head. So he's obviously not talking about hair there. For as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither is the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. The word power there is not dunamis, which is power, kaboom, explosion. It's exousia, which is the issue of authority. That's the word power that deals with authority. For the woman is of the man, even so the man also by the woman, but all things are of God. Judging yourselves, is it comely 
That is, is it befitting? Is it beautiful? Is it, is it attractive that a woman pray unto God uncovered? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. He's saying, oh, wait a minute. Is she supposed to have something on top of the hair? Not supposed to have something on top of the hair. Is she supposed to be shaved bald if she doesn't have something on top of the hair? What's going on here in this passage? The charismatics like to grab verse 5, that first verse that I read, every woman that prayeth or prophesieth. They say, see, and they stopped with that and they forget the rest of the passage. Uh, they scream and yell that Paul taught that women should be prophesying in the church. And many female charismatic leaders perch very high on this verse and they grin through their ugly lipstick and plastic hair, but they totally ignore the rest of the passage. Paul's point is not that the church should make sure that it has a female prophetess. The context is clear. The point Paul made was that whether praying or prophesying, the woman was supposed to have two things. So whether praying or prophesying, a woman is supposed to have two things. Number one, long hair. And number two, a head covering. A hat, a bonnet, scarf, mantilla, or something like that. That's followed by another twofold division. A lot of interesting parallels of twos today that we're looking at. It's followed by another twofold division. The reasons given for it are not cultural. I used to argue this in college. I mean, in the sessions where the guys would sit around in the dorms and we'd argue and scream and yell at each other and <laughs> we'd get out of hand. <laughs> and some guys would stomp out of the room. I never stomped out of the room. But some of them would stomp out of the room when they couldn't answer the questions. And they would say, it was cultural. Because back in those days, a woman who didn't have on some kind of a scarf on her head would have been considered a prostitute. Have you ever heard that argument? I heard that all the time in college because they were determined that this was not what this passage said. And so without a scintilla of evidence that only prostitutes walked around without a head covering, and that was the way men could tell prostitutes, well, maybe some prostitutes walked around without head coverings. Who knows? But that's not what Paul's talking about in the text. He's not dealing with a cultural issue. And how do we know he's not dealing with a cultural issue? Because the reasons given for doing this are not cultural. And Paul gives two reasons. Reason number one he gives is the order of creation. Man was created first. Woman was created second. Man is supposed to be the head. Woman is supposed to be the follower. The order of creation. That is not cultural reason. And number two... The presence of angels viewing the assembly of the church. Paul tells us that the, this caused the woman ought to have power on her head because of the angels. Now, some, we're look at some other passages of scripture that explain that. But that is not a cultural reason. Angels are present here in this auditorium today. You can't see them. I can't see them. But the word of God says they're here viewing this assembly and learning from this assembly and seeing certain things that are obedient and certain things that are disobedient in this assembly and hearing this message and looking at your responses. We'll talk about the passages that tell us that in just a moment. But here Paul mentions the angels as one of the reasons why a woman should wear a head covering. That's not cultural. We are actually teaching angels both by our doctrine and also our practice. Peter says so. Let me read you 1 Peter 1.12. Unto whom, speaking of the prophets of the Old Testament, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that preach the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Angels are not omniscient. They are learning. And they are learning through what they see in the church. And there are a myriad of angels. And sometimes I think the angels are up there, oh, praise God, that church is functioning the way it's supposed to. And other times they're sitting up there groaning and thinking, oh my Lord, why are you letting them get away with this? They're learning. They're here. 
They're watching you and me today. Everything you do, everywhere you go, they're angelic beings because there are demonic forces watching you too, looking for opportunities to make you fall. And if we had time, we would do a study on angels whereby we could demonstrate that there are angelic beings who protect each one of us, to whom God has committed our care since we were children. Jesus talked about how their angels of the little ones do always behold the face of my Father, which is in heaven, watching out for those who are his children. And sometimes we insist on doing things that are wicked and evil and sinful and stubborn, and it must cause great grief of heart when the holy angels who watch us see us falling for the traps and the wiles of the devil. Anyway, back to our text. So those two reasons are why there are two different kinds of coverings mentioned in the text. Order of creation and the angels. There are two kinds of coverings. One is a natural covering, that's the long hair. And the second is a theological covering, the head covering, the hat, the scarf, the mantilla. Paul is clearly not exhorting the church to get female prophetess leaders in this text. On the contrary, Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, specifically states that women may not teach men in the assembly or lead in a preaching ministry in worship. Further, vocal prayer in the worship assembly is also limited to men. We find that stated specifically over in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. I will, therefore, that men pray everywhere. Now, the word men here is not the generic term anthropos, which can include both men and women. The term that Paul uses here is the word aner, which means males. So, the first verse, verse 8, he's going to be addressing males. The second verse, verse 9, he's going to be addressing females. He's talking about them distinctly and what their distinct responsibilities and roles are. I will, therefore, that men, males, pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. A lot of people take that verse to say, oh, that means we're supposed to raise our hands whenever we're in the worship service. The emphasis is not on hands. The emphasis is on holy a lot of them out there wiggling their hands in the air are doing all kinds of carnal and perverse and wicked and ugly and immoral things on the side. But they think they're worshiping God because they got their hands in the air. The emphasis is on holy. Dear people, we serve a holy God who sees, as do the angels and the demons, what we do in secret when we think no other human being is watching. Lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Someday we'll expo- expound that passage because those two keys are very important without wrath and doubting. But then we get to verse 9, which tells us about the women. In like manner also. In other words, Paul is paralleling the men with the women. In like manner also that women. So. What you see in verse 8 is going to have a parallel in verse 9. That women adorn themselves in modest apparel. Do you think a woman in immodest apparel could be a distraction to the men in the assembly? I've been in some of these modern charismatic churches. When I go on vacation, I try to find some place to go to worship when I am traveling. And I've been in some real doozies of churches. I did a musical tour about 40-some years ago with my brother and sister. And we traveled to 40 different churches in eight different western states putting on sacred classical concerts, cello, viola, and piano. And I don't know how some of those churches ended up getting us in there because, boy, it was not our cup of tea, and we weren't their cup of tea either. And you wouldn't believe how some women come dressed or undressed to church. As though they were going to sun on the beach. Paul has something to say about that. That women adorn themselves in modest apparel. And adorning themselves in modest apparel also includes a certain attitude. With shamefacedness 
and sobriety. That means with downcast eyes, we're not boldly staring at everybody and trying to get their attention and grinning at them. And sobriety, that seriousness of purpose. They're not dolling up their hair either. Not with braided hair. Not wearing lots of fancy jewelry. Or gold or pearls or costly array. Showing off it. Well, it's modest, but boy, you know, I got this at Neiman Marcus. And I paid $1,242.37. And then there was tax on top of that. <laughs> but it's modest. But it's really nice. Don't you think? Don't you wish you had this dress on too? You are dirt. You buy your clothes at Walmart. Or pearls. Or costly array. Women are not to draw attention to themselves by what they wear or by other external things. But he tells us what they are supposed to do. He gave one verse to men. Now he's been talking about women. And he's got a lot of stuff to say to the women. But, which because of women professing godliness, you claim to be a believer? You claim to be godly? Okay, what should characterize you as a godly woman? But which becomes women professing godliness with good works. You say you're a Christian woman? How has it changed your life? What are you doing? Paul talks about in another portion of text uh, the aged widows who are not to be taken unto the number of those who are supported by the church under the age of 60. But they also have to have been women who are reported well for good works. They've provided hospitality to other believers. They've cared for the sick. They've raised children. Their children and husbands are apparently dead because they are widows indeed. And they're not to be taken in unless they have this character quality. Their life is characterized by their good works, which, as you know, are defined not as helping little old ladies across the street because they're little old ladies themselves, not by doing all kinds of worldly good deeds, but good works are characterized in Scripture by works that are done by faith, in obedience to the Word of God, in the power of the Holy Spirit, and to the glory of God. You've heard me preach on that. Those are the four tests of a good works. And if those four tests are not present, it is not a good work. Then verse 11, which gets down to where we are talking about. Let the women, the women are not supposed to be the prophetesses teaching in the church. Let the women learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Now notice that's in addition to the prayer restriction back in verse 8. There's also a teaching restriction here. And there's the reason. Verse 13. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Women are more susceptible to being deceived, therefore they should not be in positions of teaching. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing, if they, that is the husband and wife, continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Folks, those are God's standards. Those are not my standards. Those are God's standards. A Christian woman wants to come safely through childbearing, wants to have her baby safely. Paul gives you a way to do it in verse 15. When the husband and wife continue in faith, Charity, that's agape love. That's not carnal passion. That's not friendship. That's agape love. It's described in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Agape love includes all the character qualities, not just one or two. And they have to continue in holiness. Want to be brought safely through childbearing? It's a dangerous time for women, you know. I was with Judy. At the birth of all 13 of our children, it's a painful time. It's a dangerous time. It's a hard time. 
It's a time when a woman can die. Continue in holiness and sobriety. That doesn't mean drunkenness or not drunken. It means seriousness of purpose. By the way, did you notice something as I was reading that just then? When Paul talked about the women not leading in the worship, not teaching men, learning in silence with all subjection, did you notice that the reason for doing that is not cultural? It says, because Adam was first formed, then Eve. Paul appeals to the order of creation just like he did back in 1 Corinthians. That is not a cultural issue. So, how do I reconcile these commands? I can't believe I'm almost out of time. So how do I reconcile these commands with what appears to be the activity of certain women in the Bible? Well, the first thing we start off with is God never contradicts himself. Uh, God doesn't, you know, flip-flop one way or the other and think one thing's okay today and think one thing's okay tomorrow. And Well, I don't really know for sure, and maybe both are okay. Like the Catholics, you know, eating meat on uh, Friday before the Pope you know, said it was okay, uh, you eat meat on Friday, you die without going to confession first, you go straight to hell, no stops at, at go, you know, and don't pick up $200 and all that. But I say it's okay now. So now you can eat meat on Friday, and if you die before going to confession, hey, you'll make it to purgatory instead of making it to hell. God is not like that, folks. So the first thing we start with is God never gives spiritual gifts contrary to the clear commands of Scripture. He's not going to give you a gift that disobeys the commands of the Bible. So what is our solution when we see all these prophetesses of the Old Testament, when we see this business of Anna the prophetess, you know, before the day of Pentecost, a reference out of Joel 2, quoted in Acts chapter 2, about the last days and young women prophesying, and what about this business where Paul talks about prophetess over there in 1 Corinthians? How do we reconcile those things? And there are three solutions. Some apply in one case, some apply in a different case. There are three things a woman can do that fit the illustrations of prophesying that we've given you. Solution number one. I hope you write these solutions down. You'll probably have to have them at some time. Solution number one. Remember back there in Isaiah verse, chapter 8, verse 3, it says, I went in to the prophetess, and she conceived and bore a son, and we called his name Maher Shalal Hashbaaz. Um, it appears that the wife of a prophet was called a prophetess. That would cover some of those instances. The wife of a prophet is called a prophetess. We never have the prophecy of Isaiah's wife, whatever her name was. We have the prophecies of Isaiah. However, there's a challenge to the wife solution. I hope you thought of it as soon as I gave that to you. Because remember it says Philip's daughters were virgins and they prophesied. They obviously weren't wives of prophets. Philip's daughters were virgins, so how do we handle that problem? Well, that solution is also simple enough and brings us to the second and third categories. Solution number two. The term prophetess and prophecy are clearly used to refer to the singing of the women as in our passage in Exodus 15, verses 1 through 21. Those words are clearly called also the song of Moses, both in Exodus 15 and Revelation 15. In other words, Miriam did not make up the words. She didn't get new special revelation from God. It was new special revelation that God had given to Moses. That revelation given in musical poetic form to Moses, which Miriam and the women sang. The term to prophesy is clearly used of singing scriptures set to music in poetic form. We see the entire New Testament church, including women, doing this with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs referred to by Paul. And of course, we studied that in a great deal of detail uh, for 16 weeks uh, over the last three months. Solution number three. There's a third possibility as well. Now, some or all may apply in different categories, but <clears throat> solution number three, the third possibility, the term is apparently used for any wise woman who gave counsel based on revealed truth. In other words, based on scripture. Wise women. Not one who received new special revelation, but revelation already given. Deborah and Huldah fit into that category. 
So it covers, I think, all the different possibilities. Thus a prophetess could either be the wife of a prophet or women singing in the congregation. Or perhaps they could be singing special music, which is what I think Philip's daughters were probably doing in the church. They're known for their ladies' quartet. They sang already revealed scripture, such as the Psalms, and so they got special mention there in the text. A false prophetess was not one who had the spiritual gift of prophecy. A false prophet prophetess was one who had a counterfeit gift, a satanic imitation, a manifestation that was fake of the gift of prophecy. You've heard of fake news? Well, we have fake prophecies too. Now, of course, we've already studied a lot about false prophecy uh, when we went through the book of Acts, when we studied Simon the Sorcerer, which led us into a multi-week in-depth study of what the Bible says about witchcraft and the occult and why God condemns it and judges it. And that actually brings us to our new material for today, and our time is up. So we will start the new material, the Lord willing, next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. We thank you that in your grace and mercy you have given it to us so that we might know who you are and what you desire for us to do. You've given it to us to make us strong in the battle, for it is as a sword, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, to battle against the wiles of the devil and his host. And Father, he has tried to talk us into many things being cultural. Right now there are even evangelicals who are claiming that the passages that Paul wrote in Romans 1 against homosexuals were just abusive homosexuals, but that God loves all those homosexuals and it's okay because they love one another. That's dirty, filthy stuff. It's a twisting of your word. Help us to understand your word, not to be have it twisted by those who would seek to lead us into error, but help us to believe it and obey it so that we might serve you in faithfulness and in truth. Father, we thank you for the time we've had together today. We pray that you will bless it, encourage our hearts, and direct our application of it in the days to come. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is hymn number 623, Jesu Mein